Ja witają. Wybaczcie, ja nie rozmawiam ukraińsku. Ja. Ja Huelius and Nalete Horiuki. Sorry, this is how I know what to say. So thank you very much. Yesterday, I know you guys prefer if I could speak Ukrainian, but yesterday I saw some of the rooms. Uh, very, very full rooms of people speaking uh, Ukrainian or Russian, so you know, I understand I have the same problem in Brazil. Uh, when we try to bring speakers, uh, international speakers, we always have you know, uh, the language problem. So I understand totally this, and you know, we try to, uh, to do the best we can, right? You know, but it's very important for all of you, uh, I'm, I'm actually very, very happy uh, to be here. It's very nice to, to be in a conference where most of the talks are actually being done in English because it means all of you here are actually able to, you know, you're, you are um, alphabetizing programmers, right? Because we, we like to say this, you know, if you don't, unfortunately, in our field, if you don't speak English, you have a big problem. So congratulations to all of you that you're, you're, you're doing very, very well, right? Because you're, you're actually here um, you know, able to, to, to participate. Um, and I, I always say that the only, um, the only blog post that I have in Portuguese on my blog is the one that says you need to learn English. <laughs> because, because in Brazil is different than here, uh, we do have much more people that don't speak English. Right? So we have a much larger problem. So congratulations to all of you. And I'd like to thank, you know, uh, the organizers for, for inviting me here. Thanks a lot. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, 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 you know, the guys from Jalaski also for, for, for inviting me here. Uh, it's been, I, I, I wanted to come since last year, and it's, it's, it's like a dream come true. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to talk here a little bit today about uh, the future Java developer. And so the, the whole idea here is not a talk, you know, I, I know when I, every time I put this, this title up, People think I'm going to talk about, you know, you know that you're going to program it for minds, you know, you're going to have like, you know, this, this uh, uh, minority report thing that's just going to move your hand and everything's going to happen. That's not what we're going to talk about, right? Because what's going to happen in the future, the tools we're going to use, the technology that we're going to, we're going to create, uh, all going to come from this room right here, right? You are the future job developer. You, whatever you decide to do, that's what's going to be the future. So I think it's most, most important for us to talk about us right now, what we can do to be uh, this, this, this future developer, and exactly what, what kind of things we can, we can have. And you all enjoyed a lot James Gosling uh, talking yesterday, and James had some very good tips uh, for, uh, for us developers of what we should do uh, to improve our career. And I think this is the this kind of things we're going to talk a little bit here. Uh, about improving our careers. Um, but I'm going to start with uh, a, short, a short thing, uh, just kind of tell you a little bit about, about my story. And, and my story starts a long time ago. So I'm 14 years old. Years old. It's a, today, it's a very, very interesting day, very nice day. Was uh, I, me and my two sisters, we left to um, visit a waterfall. It was one of the most wonderful days in my life. You see the pictures of that day, and they were amazing pictures, right? It's some, some of the happiest moments that we had. Uh, it was really, it was like a very, very nice day, very nice weather. We got all this amazing uh, uh, natural uh, waterfalls, a little bit far away from the city. Um, Everything was so, we were so great. When we are coming back from this trip, we suffered a car accident. Uh, the car turned over several times, and my two sisters were thrown out of the car. And my younger sister, Poliana, 
She had 12 years old. She died at eight. My, young, my older sister, Giselle, she spent 45 days in coma in the hospital. And um, it was really hard for my parents. And even today, many, many years later, she still never, she, she, she didn't recover. She still walks badly, talks badly. And at that particular day, uh, when I got home, I saw my mom laying down in bed, crying. And my father, you know, not knowing what to do. I unconsciously took the decision of never giving my parents any more problems. Not that I think I gave any problems before that, but that particular day, and I became a perfectionist. A guy that tries to do everything right. Fast forward many years later, being a perfectionist had helped me in lots of different ways, right? I ended up being uh, uh, hired by Sun Microsystems in 1995, right? Actually, two weeks before uh, the first announcement of job I was ever made. And I had the luck of, because I knew English like you guys do, I had the luck of meeting a person from the United States. I was in Brazil. I mean, I had a person, I met a person from the United States that talked to me about Java before Java was announced. So, it was, so I really started working with Java, you know, about a week before the first public announcement of Java. And that's really changed my, 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 my life, right? It really changed my career. I became one of the first um, Sun had at that time, a group called the Java Aces. There was about 100 people around the world that was promoting Java. So I, I became one of these, I was one of the very, very few Java Aces outside of the US, right? And for Brazil, this means a lot. Because Brazil's always had, you know, always seen technology many, many years after it actually happened. And Java was the first technology that came on the time of the internet. So it was the first technology that we actually had all those those tools, you know, that, that we had access to it right when it was starting. So you know, if we, in 1996, I was already answering questions on the international Java mailing list, and you know. So for me, I thought, you know, that's, that was the move of my career, right? So there's all kinds of interesting things, all kinds of, of, of nice projects that was going on at that time. Um, I was working in San Francisco, Brazil, and I, I had all this, uh, this, this, you know, Bank of Brazil. Uh, in 1997, Bank of Brazil took the decision of train, to train 400 developers in Java and move all of their development in Java. And I had the chance to be part of this huge project. So for me, it was really, really good. So, you know, I was, I was kind of on a roll, several, you know, several years later, I was like a Java evangelist, and, and I was thinking, that, you know, so Java's gonna be my life, I'm gonna do all kinds of things with Java. And so the Sun represents the Brazil president, calls me to his room, I'm like, yes! Now it's the right moment. Okay, so now I'm getting, you know, uh, trying to do things right, it's going to work out. And so I walk into the room of the president of Summer Microsoft of Brazil, very happy because something's going to change. You know, he's going to offer me a promotion or something. And he tells me, Bruno, this whole Java thing, I think we should, you should move away from it. How about you become a sales guy? I'm like, what? So I leave Summer Microsystems, right? and go do something else in my life because I'm not, you know, job for me was an important thing to do. And I kind of started again. So I kind of entered a startup, right? You know, you guys are always talking, at that time we didn't have these words, you know, that we didn't talk about startup that much. So I'm kind of starting to start doing my, my own startup. So I, I founded a company called Summa, uh, Summa Technologies. I was a, I, I actually brought this company to Brazil. They were in the US, I brought this company to Brazil. And we started doing all kinds of very, very crazy projects. I specialized in impossible projects. Projects that, were, that had the deadline was, was short, or, the, the, or they didn't have enough money anymore, or they have huge performance problems. And we specialized in crazy, crazy Java projects, right? And I had the chance to, to participate in some very, very sophisticated projects. One of the projects that won actually won a Duke's Choice Award. Actually, I participated in several projects that won Duke's Choice Awards, but one of them was the income tax application in Brazil that on the first 
first version, it had 7 million users, a desktop application. And I participated in the largest <laughs> AGB project in the world at the time. I participated in the project that was the largest iPlanet. I don't even think you guys know what iPlanet is, right? iPlanet was like an old, old Java EE application server. Actually, at that time, we called Java 2 EE application server, right? It was written in C. Right? You know, today, all the Java, the French Java application server are written in Java. At that time, you know, we still had Java application server written in C. So, you know, I participated that on, 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 those, on those crazy projects. I was trying to do kind of, you know, do, do uh, the best thing we could do. And, you know, uh, all crazy things. And then one time, I got this amazing project, because I was talking about open source and doing things like that. So I got this amazing project, customer, come to us and said that, you know, they wanted a, a project completely based on open source. They want to contribute back to the community. And, you know, they want to create some new stuff. They want to create a, a new... Uh, a, a new technology that didn't exist at the time in Brazil and everything. So I was like, I don't know what those dream projects, like, you know, we've been talking about open source for so long, you actually find a customer that wants to do this. It was the worst project of my life. You now I would get back home at night, I would cry in my wife's lap. You know, in the morning, I would tell her, why do I need to leave? It was terrible. It was the worst project I ever did in my whole life. At that moment, I decided, never again, right? I'm not gonna do this again. I'm not gonna get into this crazy, into this crazy process again. And so, uh, oh, I remember this year from James Gosling that he said yesterday, right? Uh, it has to be fun, right? If you are doing, if you're working something that's boring uh, or tedious, stop, right? And I think we have this opportunity we have this possibility because there is so many cool stuff that we can do uh, in every project out there. So I took this decision. I stopped it doing that those crazy projects, and I went back to work in open source. So I came back to some microsystems. I, I worked with NetBeans and Open Solaris, all kinds of cool. Uh, I was the worldwide NetBeans community manager. I was the worldwide Open Solaris uh, community manager. I started working with, with open source, all these very, very nice um, open source projects and everything, and again, you know, life seemed great, right? You know, things were doing fine, and I was, NetBeans was growing in, in adoption, you know, you, you heard Johnny James Gossett saying yesterday that, you know, NetBeans is the, is the tool that he used all the time, and so NetBeans was, was uh, at, when I joined NetBeans, NetBeans was mostly unknown, and, and, you know, we were able to make NetBeans very, very well known. At that time, I helped with creating the Java Champions program, uh, I created the, the NetBeans Dream Team program, so you know, just the Java Institute groups were, were, were doing fine, everything seems very fine, and then I got fired, you know, Oracle acquired Sun, and uh, the first thing they did before, actually I never worked for Oracle, because Oracle acquired Sun, and a month before they actually took over, Sun Brazil fired all the open source team, right, so I was one of those guys, got fired, and, you know, create another startup. That's a startup that I, I, I like to say I have three startups. One that pays my bill, that's so on. The one that, that I pay its bills, that's true, that's story true. The story true was a great idea, wonderful. You know, it's a, it's a collaborative way of telling stories. Beautiful job application, right? The beautiful website I ever did my whole life didn't work. Uh, actually, it works very well, right? The application is amazing, it works very well. But no one cared about using it, right? We were very bad at marketing. Actually, this year, it was really interesting because this year, 20 years of Java was the chance for Story Troop to actually succeed, right? Because it's a, it's a site to tell stories. And we have the best told Java story in Story Troop because it's a story told by many people. We couldn't sell it. <laughs> no one wants to use it. You know, it's just there. I pay, I pay its bills, nothing happens. You know, that's, that's what happens when you think you, you, you can do a company just by being a technical guy, right? Sometimes you need some kind of marketing. Um, so, I try again, and I create Tools Cloud. That's the company I work for right now. So, Tools Cloud is actually the company that pays its own bills. It doesn't pay me anything, 
but at least it pays its own bills. And it's a, it's a company that does uh, uh, tools for developers. Uh, you know, tools in the cloud, continuous delivery kind of thing. It's, a, it's an interesting ride, right? I, 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 was, I got some investors in the US, and you know, this whole startup thing that we always hear people talking about, I tried to leave it, right? So I went to the US, I live it in a, in a, uh, in a underground, right? The, 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 the uh, lower floor of my investor's house, there's no windows at all, right? We just kind of stay there. Um, it's you know, woodwork, day and night, doesn't matter because there's, uh, you, know, uh, you could see the light of day anyway. I, I sleep for a month in a room that the air conditioning was right there. So you see that, ooh, all day long. So you didn't know it was light day or whatever. So, you know, just working uh, my butt off, really, really, at that time. And then went bankrupt. <laughs> I was my background because those clouds still going on strong. But you know, we had to make a deal with, with some some investors in the US to not not really go down. You know, things like you know, things things happening. And then because this is kind of the dream, right? You know, I love I love Scrooge. This this dog, I'm not sure how you call him here, but Scrooge, yes? So this is you know, the, the richest guy on earth, right? That's the dream, right? We're, we're developers because that's what we want. We want to, to, to be well in life. We want to do everything we want, right? We want to swim in, in money. Or do we? I don't want to swim in money, right? You know, it's, first of all, I think it's very uncomfortable. Right? <laughs> it must hurt. But the thing is, <coughs> the reason why I like Scrooge is not because the money, right? It's because Behind every, you know, you, you see every story of this duck. That it's it's not as about, you know, this whole character is about the money, but in every story, he does a lot of adventures, right? He does everything he wants. You know, he flies on airplanes, he goes mountain hiking, you know, he fights villains, he does all kinds of things. He's never stopping, he's never satisfied with what he's doing. Right? And I think this is the chance that we all have. We have one of the best professions in the world. Right? We are actually able to work in whatever we want. And it's amazing how many of us choose to do some of the things that I did, like you know, do boring and, and, and projects where I actually work with projects and customers keep yelling at you all the time. Right? So a lot of times we, we uh, we have to think that, you know, there is an adventure for what we can do, right? As developers, we really can change the world, right? And uh, because one of the things that we live right now, and uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, sometimes we think that I, uh, we just have, uh, we're just waiting for have the right idea that will change the world, right? Is it what you think? You know, so I'm going to have this idea and I'm going to change the world. I have my friend Ruslan here, for example, that you know, he keeps saying, oh, I'm, I have this idea, going to change the world all the time. But the thing is, most people have ideas that can change the world and, and just an idea is like a lamp at the beach, like this. It's worth nothing. Well, many times, I, since I work for a lot of startups, many times the start, if guys are beauty startups come to me and say, Oh, you know, I wanna, I wanna, I have this idea that I wanna tell you, but it's a secret. You have to sign an NDA. And then I tell him, don't tell me that, because I don't care for ideas that are secrets. Because any idea is just an idea, unless you go and you make it, you implement it, you make it happen. And very good ideas can be badly implemented and, and, and take it go nowhere. Or even they can be very well implemented and because you don't know how to, to, to present to people, because you don't know how to sell to people, then they, can, they don't go anywhere, right? So many uh, founders of startups think that, oh, I'm a technical guy. I did this many times, right? I'm a technical guy, so I work on the technical stuff. My technology is the best technology out there and I'll leave the marketing. For someone else. I'll leave sales for someone else. I did this mistake 
right? I hired a marketing and a sales team, and I just focus on, mar on, on the technical side, and let, they, the, uh, let those guys do their work. And because I did not understand anything about sales, I did not understand anything about marketing, they did whatever they wanted. And they were unable to transmit my vision. So it didn't go anywhere. I spent a lot of money on marketing that didn't do any good. I spent a lot of money uh, that I could be doing very cool stuff with on, on trying to sell things without any results. So a lot of times we need to get involved, right? And a lot of times we need to, to, to participate more. And the interesting thing is, right now at the moment, that's a phrase from Forbes. And Forbes says that now, not tomorrow, not in the future, but right now, every single company, your company, is a software company. And the companies that don't understand that they are a software company, they're gonna disappear somewhere. So your company may think that you build cars. Maybe your company thinks that you deliver food. Maybe your company thinks that you, you know, you are a hotel company. But really, you are a software company. Think about it. The largest transport company in the world doesn't have a single car. That's Uber. The largest hotel chain in the world has no rooms. That's Airbnb. The largest content website in the planet produces no content. That's Facebook. They're all software companies enabling people to do stuff, to do things, right? And because they understand they are a software company, because they work as a software company, they are able to do those things. And a lot of times, our companies, we think we are something else. And we forgot that we are a software company and that we need to be really, really good in doing software. And by being really, really good doing software, it means one thing. We gotta... <coughs> Delivery software. Because the, the reason we don't write software just to write software. We don't write software just, just because it's, it's cool. We write software to solve someone's problem. We write software to enable our users to do something. Right? We write software to, to, to make someone's life better. You know, make someone have entertainment, or someone be able to book a hotel in an easy way, or someone be able, don't need to go to the bank to do whatever they, you know, to, to solve their, their problems. We write software to solve a problem. But if we don't deliver the software, it doesn't do any good. And it's, it's very funny that the industry as a whole, we got in a, we put ourselves in a corner. A lot of times we get to projects and we, and, and we write great software and that software stays there in a repository for days, for weeks, for months. Think about it, right? The software is, is done, it's ready. You, you wrote the software, you test it, it solves a problem and it just stays there collecting dust in the repository. It doesn't solve a problem for anyone because it never gets delivered. It never gets in production. Because it takes... And then for all those days, weeks or months, your user on the other side, he's there having the same problem that he has every day. Because your software that already solved that problem, it's a student repository, it doesn't get, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't get put in production. And so because of this, I was talking another day with a friend of mine, Axel Yanaga. His name is on, on the end of this talk because he gives this talk with me sometimes. And we're talking about DevOps some time ago. And you know, we're like saying, okay, so so you know we need to, to help people to deliver software better. 
And that flock seems to be a cool stuff. And um, an answer would tell me is yes, Bruno, because that flock is really important. Because that flock is a change in culture. We have to change the culture of our companies. And I was like, okay, so that's not going Right? I'm a developer. I can't change the culture of my company. Right? You know, it's, uh, I'm worse than a developer. I'm a consultant. Right? So as a consultant, I get to, the, to, a, to a project, and everyone, don't trust me. Everyone thinks I don't know enough technology. Everyone thinks that I'm being overpaid, that I, I, pay, I receive more than, than, than the, the people in the project do. And everyone thinks I'm just going to be there for a few days and then, go, and then leave. And they're going to have to handle everything that, I, everything that I did wrong. So a consultant doesn't help anything. Right? We, don't, we can't change culture. So if DevOps, it's a change in culture, then we can't do anything. And we're just doing this discussion. And then Ed's going to say, yes, but you know, we need to deliver software, we need to deliver software, we need to deliver software. And suddenly, it was like a, a boom in my head. You know, I got a flashback, and I remember the day of the car accident that I just told you guys about. And I remember my decision of being a perfectionist. And I realized for the first time in my whole life, <coughs> that being a perfectionist is not a good thing. A lot of us, we like to say we are perfectionists, but being a perfectionist is a big mistake because the perfectionist is the guy that's afraid of delivering. The perfectionist is the guy that's, that's is so afraid of delivering that he always wants to be better. Oh, it's not ready. It needs one more test. It needs one more, more feature. It's going to be better tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. And it's never ready to be delivered. Right? Because we're always, and then we, we, we kind of create as an industry so, so many times. Companies are not perfectionists, but, come, but, but we have perfectionists in our company. And so many times, we keep delaying the most important thing in our careers, there is delivery software. That's the thing we must do as developers. That's why we were born for. That's what we work for. That's, that's the thing we should be doing every day. And we keep delaying it because we think that tomorrow we're going to be better. There's one more test to be written. There's one more thing that needs to be fixed. Right? And our definition of done, it's always tomorrow, right? So we say, oh, it's done. I just need to fix this one problem here, right? Oh, it's done. I just need to commit to a repository. Oh, it's done. You just need to run the tests. Oh, it's done. I just need to, to deploy. Oh, it's done. It's just a little configuration mistake. I'm just going to fix it. And then, oh, it's done. Then the guy says, well, the customer's complaint is not working. Oh, but he works on my machine. Right? We are always delaying. The problem of the perfectionist is that we delay, 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 and at some point, someone says, it has to be put tomorrow. And then you put anything, something, anything. It doesn't matter. Just whatever you have, it's not ready, and you just put it in production. Right? Because someone has said it has to be done. So, uh, we need to change that. We developers need to take the responsibility of delivering software. We're in a moment right now that we think that the responsibility to deliver software is from is the guys in operations. We write the software, operations put in production. And the more we think that operations put in production, the less responsibility we have for the software that we wrote. Right? Because the software is done. It's just in your repository somewhere. Eventually, you'll be in production, and eventually, it will work, and eventually, there's going to be a bug, and eventually. And we need, if we're talking about career here, <coughs> right? If we want to improve our developer career, we need to take the responsibility to deliver software. And at that moment, I told Edson, I said, Edson, that 
boxes, we together, the whole company, right, together, continuous delivering software, right? This is what we must do as developer. Oh, come on, Bruno, what do you mean about continuous delivery software? Is this whole thing about like commit the code and then it gets into production immediately? Yes. That's what I mean. But it's hard. <coughs> I know it's hard. So much better than, than doing this is let's, let's cut in half the time you take to deliver software today. If you deliver software once a year, let's deliver software once every six months. If you deliver software once every six months, let's deliver once every three months. If you already deliver software monthly, let's do it every 15 days. Right? If you deliver software every week, let's try to deliver software every, you know, twice a week. One thing that everyone is afraid is, so if I increase the rate of the software that I deliver, it means I'm re I'm, I have more risk. And it's the other way around. The more frequently we release software, the less change there is in our software. The less bugs we introduce. Right? Because we got into this, this, uh, this industry-wide thing that we, have, we deliver the software and something goes wrong. So next time, we say, okay, so something went wrong, so we need more time of testing. We need more time of planning. We need more time for something else, more meetings, more whatever. And then we delay the, 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 the release of the software. And so now we have more bugs, more codes, more functionality, more changes in the database, more everything. And of course, there's more chance that something goes wrong. And when it goes wrong, oh, we delay even more. Right? Because now next time, we're going to plan more, we're going to do more, and then we're going to, and then that's where we got right now. We got this terrible fear of delivering. And when we say continuous delivery, right, is that we have to, 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 to remove all the barriers to deliver. And even the fact that someone has to press a button to put the software in production, that's a barrier, right? Because that person that has to press the button, he's going to say, oh, one more meeting, just so I make sure that I can press the button. And then we start all over again, right? So that's our responsibility as developers to focus on continuous delivery software, right? And, you know, and reducing the time that we need. We gotta, we gotta stop being perfectionists. Stop being procrastinators, right? We gotta focus on delivering. And you all remember that Scrooge has a lucky coin, right? His first coin. And we developers, we also have a lucky coin also, but I like to say we have three lucky coins. When you're thinking about our careers, it's very, very normal that we think, okay, I'm a developer, so what I gotta do is I gotta improve my coding. Yes, you gotta improve your coding. And we think that's our lucky coin, right? If, I, if I'm a very good developer, I'm gonna write very good code, and that's gonna be great. Yes, it is. And uh, but one problem that we have many times is that, you know, you know when you, you, you uh, uh, Ihor was telling me, hello, he was telling me here before the, the talk, uh, that he was a uh, rock band, right, he had a rock band. And I'm sure that when Ihor decided to, to do his first show, right, he got his guitar, was guitar he playing? Yes, he got his guitar. And for the first time, it just went there and started playing, right? In front of a thousand people, it was like this. You never practice anything, right? Yes? Just start playing? You never practice, you never, you just got a guitar, went in front of a thousand people, start playing. No, you practice, right? You had to practice a lot. And it's funny that we developers, right? When is our show moment? Our show moment is when we implement a new feature, right? That's when our show moment. And when that feature gets in, gets in the hands of users, that's, that's when everyone sees that. When our show moment, we write the code. 
And we think that we can just come to the work one day without having any practice and just sit down and write code. And we don't practice. <coughs> right? We, we, we just learn something and just go and do our show. And we got to practice. Right? So, think I was saying yesterday, you know, get out of your comfort zone. Every day, spend some time being really uncomfortable. That means every day, spend some time practicing, <coughs> improving what you know. Right? You can't just you can't just practice while you're doing your show. Right? So, for example, one of, one of the suggestions we give is to practice code katas. Right? If you, if you, have, if, if you, if you are, well, if you've ever played martial arts, or, uh, you know what kata is, right? A kata is a repeated movement that you do all the time. If you don't play art, martial arts, you, maybe you saw the movie, right? Or the little boy has to, has to practice like cleaning the guy's car, this kind of thing, right? Gotta take it. You know, and it, that's a kata, right? You practice a kata thousands of times. Why? Because when you, it's time to do the fights, you can't be thinking, oh, now I have to do this movement. Now I have to do another movement. No, you have to be paying attention to the other guy. You have to be paying attention to everything that's happening around you. So all the movements have to be automatic. And as developers, that's the same thing. Your short codes for your IDE have to be automatic. You know, the, the, the coding, the pattern coding for doing, uh, you know, generics, or lambda or whatever has to be automatic. You, you can't be thinking about that if you want to think about your problem. Right? So you have to be really good at those things automatically. So you can think about the big problem. So you, we got we gotta practice code. But I understand everyone here thinks that code is, is good, so I, most of you will probably do some kind of practice of code, but we usually forget then we have two other coins that we need to pay attention to. One of them is community. Right? You are here participating in an event, so you're already, you're already much better than everyone else. Right? So congratulations. Because right now, there are thousands of developers here in Ukraine that are not here. That did, they're not participating. I'm sure there are people that were asking for the event and didn't come. Right now, <coughs> you see there's some chairs empty right now because there's people that decide to stay home. Right? And we think that, you know, oh, my focus is just coding. I don't need to worry too much about community. But yes, we do need to worry about community. And it's very nice, very interesting because we're nerds, right? We're all nerds. And it's, it, we, it's nice to see in the audience, you see things like this. On the second row here, there's an empty chair. There's a guy sitting right there. Hi. Hello. There's two other empty chairs. There's two guys together. Do you know each other? Yes. Usually, right? We sit by who we know. And there's a chair. And there's a lady right there, sitting alone. Hi. And there's another chair. There's a guy sitting right there. We don't talk to each other. We just talk to people that we know. Right? Because we're nerds, right? We don't... You know, do, do you guys know what the difference between um, an outspoken nerd and a, a, and a, a non-outspoken nerd? No? So, the, the non-outspoken nerd, he looks at his feet when he's talking to you, right? The outspoken nerd, he looks at your feet when he talks to you. <laughs> That's why I wear funny shoes, because the guy look at my feet and say, that's funny shoes, then you start a conversation, <laughs> right? And so right now, look around you, look at the people that you don't know around you and say hello. Right now, yes, say hello to the guy right behind you. <laughs> you know each other, right? Say hello, yes, because he doesn't want to talk to you either, right? So, I know this, so say hello, yes, right now. You know, that's why we are here. The only reason why we come to a presidential event is to meet people, to do community. If we come to your events and you don't meet anyone new, you could have stayed home. 
right? All the talks are being recorded. I can guarantee you there's 100% of the talks being given here, including mine. You can just go online and find a copy of it somewhere, right? So you're not here to hear me speaking, I'm sure about that. But I hope you're here to meet me, to come say hello, to exchange cards, to, to exchange Twitter accounts. And even if you don't, if you don't have enough work to say hello, right? Then people ask why you wear a Brazilian flag, because that's a good way for people to come to me and say hello. Right? You know, it's it's already weird enough, so you can just say why you're wearing a Brazilian flag, so you're in the conversation, right? You don't need to think about why you need to talk to me, right? So we gotta meet people, make a point of meeting new people every time you are in events. Because that's what builds community. And that's what will advance your career. Make a point to come to events and give a talk. Right? And I think it's very funny that a lot of times for the organizers, you gotta go inside the speaker's room and kick everyone out. Right? Because these speakers have to be out there talking with everyone. Because that's the reason why we're here. Because the main reason why we're here in the conference is to talk to people. To, 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 to create new, new, new alliances, new friendships and everything. Right? Because that's what's going to be left. I mean, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but people are usually afraid of coming on stage. I'm always afraid of coming on stage. Right? I'm always shaking. But, you know, the fact is, a presentation on stage, you guys are just going to remember at most 20% of everything I said. So, you know, most of the things I said, you're going to forget anyway. Right? So, you, you know, so you should be coming here to give talks to. Right? Because people are going to forget what you said anyway. Right? So, it's a great, yes, it's true. So, you should, you, everyone here should submit talks next year and come here as a speaker and submit talks to other conferences. Participate in the community. That's really, really important for your career. That's what's going to change your career. Right? Yesterday we were talking about me and Arun Gupta right there. We we're talking about Java Champions. Right? Actually, this morning, not even yesterday. Right? And you get all the Java Champions. There are all speakers somewhere. Right? You have to be. That's, that's what changes your career, to participate in the community. And the other thing, oh, there's a Marta Gabriel, is a, it's a, a, a lady in Brazil that's, that's re really into uh, startups and everything. And she says that we must collaborate. It's impossible to do it alone, right? That's why it's so important to do open source. If you don't want to come here and give talks, you can participate in the community. At least participate in open source projects. Open source <laughs> is the way for you to meet other developers. I think it's very funny. So let me ask one question here. I'm sure, I'm sure those days, most everyone is going to hand, raise their hand anyway. But how many here have accounts on Facebook or Twitter? Everyone, right? How many here have accounts on GitHub? <laughs> very good. You see, GitHub, we, we all can have accounts on Facebook, that's fine. But GitHub, is where we meet other developers like we are. It's very funny that people, you know, a lot of times people have accounts on Facebook or Twitter and don't have accounts on, on GitHub. So where are going to meet developers, right? So participate in open source projects. Some people ask me, but how am I going to make money out of open source? That is the wrong question. Because making money is hard. No matter what you do. Doesn't matter if you do open source, proprietary, or, or, or sell cars, or whatever you do, making money is hard. Right? But learn from open source. It's easy. And that's what we need. We need to learn more. That's actually what a phrase that James Gosling used yesterday. Uh, I guess you're going to jump to this, right? Keep learning. Keep learning all the time. That's what we need to do. But one of the things that I want to point out is that our other point here is new ideas. We gotta be all the time learning new stuff, right? Because we need to open our minds to new ideas all the time. The other thing James said yesterday is Java has the best diversity. 
Learn once, reuse anywhere. The other side of water, right? Once, uh, 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 oh man. Run it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I had reuse in my head. Right once, run anywhere, right? Sorry. I kept, kept reusing, kept coming to my head, right? So, right once, re, uh, run anywhere, but the other side of, of water is water. Learn once, reuse anywhere. We have the best technology to experiment with other things, right? You want to do Internet of Things, you can. You want to do supercomputer, you can. You can do anything you want because everything has Java in it that helps us by with the knowledge that we already have, we can learn new stuff, right? So we, sh we should use this more. Java, right? You, you get Java 1, for example, this year, right? Java 1, we had a lot of Internet of Things. We had a lot of open source of open JDK. We had a lot of cloud computing, right? We can do all those things. Doesn't matter how small it is or how big it gets. We can do all those things because we're Java developers. So let's use this to keep learning. Right? And uh, Java also has a very a very strong community. There's a lot of Java user groups participating on OpenJDK, on the JCP, for example. So you, you can participate uh, with, on your user group. Right? There's a Ukrainian user group here that has a very, very strong uh, adopted JSR program with lots of people participating. You can participate in those things. Get involved. That's, that's how you're going to improve your career. You can learn new languages on top of the Java VM, right? That's what Vinkat was talking yesterday. <laughs> Try to be, un be uncomfortable, right? Try something new all the time. We need to do this to be better developers. And that's where cloud comes along. Oh, not this cloud, that cloud, <laughs> right? Cloud computing is a very important skill for us to have. Because it allows us to experiment with all kinds of different things. But the most important skill that we have when you're talking about DevOps right now, when you're talking about delivering, the most important skill, and, and when you're talking about cloud computing, we're not talking necessarily to, oh, I, I need to run my application somewhere in the cloud, in a public cloud. My company never going to allow me to do that. No, 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 no. The important technology <laughs> behind cloud computing is virtualization. So if you virtualize anything in your environment, right? Virtualize a tool in your computer, right? Gets a tool they use, they use to, uh, you know, from time to time, put inside a container, and just run your computer, for example. Virtualize your test environment, so you can repeat your test easily. Virtualize something, that's, that's the technology behind cloud computing. It doesn't matter what it is, you can run your computer, that's fine. But you have to understand that virtualization will help you automate. Virtualization will help you uh, do DevOps. Will help you deliver. Because the most important thing that we need to learn right now is containers. If we're talking about DevOps, and if you want to be a developer of the future, we are starting the container revolution. So software containers, of course, has nothing to do with those big ships here. But we are in the exact same situation that the real containers, like right, the physical containers were right after the, the, the World War. So right after the, World, the Second World War, the containers were created. The, soft, the, soft, the, 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 the hardware containers, you know, uh, before that, before existence of containers, you all know how we ship the things around the world. Because I'm, I'm sure most of you see, saw Titanic, the movie. So you remember, people bringing things inside the ship, right? Box by box, you know, they bring a car, they bring a, a box of, of hats, right? And all different things. So you had to have like people doing manual work to do every single thing inside the ship. And you know, we had a bicycle, you had to know how to, to put a bicycle and, and put up and, and, and secure a bicycle inside the, inside, inside the ship. You had to know how to secure a car inside the ship. You had to know all of that. It was labor intensive. So it was really hard to shift things around. And then someone comes with this idea, what about if you have a really big box? And inside it, you can put lots of bicycles or lots of bananas or 
a car, or whatever. And now we can just move the container to one side or the other. That was a great idea. And we started with very, very small ships, carrying lots of those containers. Today, we are carrying thousands of containers in a ship, right? Because it, it, it grew a lot, <coughs> and it changed the way, it was a silent revolution that changed the way we ship things. So today, we have around 100,000 ships in the world. Only 6,000 of those ships are container ships, like those. Less than 10%. But those container ships, they carry 90% of everything we use daily. <laughs> Containers completely change the way we ship things. Completely. Today, it's so cheap, right, to, to do uh, containers that if you fish any fish here in Europe and you have to cut the fish in small pieces, it's cheaper to send it to China to be cut in China and come back here to be sold here than it is to pay someone here to cut the fish. Because containers completely <laughs> change the way we ship stuff. And what this has to do with software? Because we are right now, right here, at the container revolution on software. How did we ship software? How do we ship software today? Today you say, okay, I have this Java application that runs on a Java EE server, like Classfish, for example, JBoss. And then you get your guys to production, your operation guys say, hey, you know, I have to put things on you know, JBoss, and I'm going to run this application here. So the guys say, okay, that's fine. So I'm going to learn how to start JBoss, how to stop JBoss, how to uh, back up JBoss, how to do uh, load balance on JBoss, how to do disaster recovery on JBoss, how to do performance on JBoss. Okay, fine. I learned how to do JBoss. You can run application on JBoss, that's fine. And then tomorrow say, hey, look, I have this new stuff here. It's going to be a, like a quick application we need to do. We're going to do it PHP. The operation guy say, okay, PHP, well, PHP is, is Apache, or, okay, I know how to run Apache. Okay, so I can run PHP. That's fine. I'm, you know, I'm going to learn how to, uh, to do load balance with PHP, who do um, backup of PHP, who do disaster recovery of PHP. That's fine. And then you say, hey, you know, I just saw uh, this presentation that we need to use closure. Let's use closure here. And the first guy, oh, no, stop right here. No closure. Right? I already learned a Java EE. I already learned a PHP. I'm not going to learn closure. I'm not going to do all those things for closure for you. And then, you know, we get stuck. Right? Because we can't inno innovate. And then we create this, this false idea that there is a fight between developers and operations, right? Because developers want to innovate, and operations don't want to innovate, right? That's what he said. Okay. And operations guys think the other way around. They say, we have to keep things stable. And developers don't think about stability. They want to change everything all the time, right? So if we change this way, instead of we, we try to work together on the same project, how about if we get our application and we put our application inside a container, right? So we can get our application, our Java application, and put our Java application inside a container and give to the guys in, in operations. Operations know how to do a container. They know how to get a container out of the ship and put in customs, get out of customs, and put on the, tr on the truck, get out of the truck, put on the train, they know how to store the container, they know how to do load balance of the container, they know, they know, they know how to do a, a, a disaster recovery of the container, they know how to move the container from one cloud to the next cloud, right? And so you put an application inside a container, give to operations. You put a PHP application inside a container, give to operations. You put a Ruby application inside a container, a closure application inside a container, give to operations. They know how to handle that. Containers will completely change the way we ship software. 
We are right here, right now. In the next few years, a lot of things are going to happen. This year was the year that Amazon launched their container ship. Right? This year was the year that Google launched their container ship. Right? We are right here. Some guys, some guys, you know, in those, in those crazy countries in Europe like Ukraine, were doing this for years. You know, you guys have, have a company here, Gelastic, that's been doing containers for many, many years, much more early, early than those guys. So you are very advanced, right? All of you are doing containers much, much earlier than everyone, the rest of the world. But the revolution is just starting, right? There's lots of, lots of things that's going to that's change in the next few years. And we have to, to, we, we have to learn this right now if you want to do, if you want to be developers of the future. So, what exactly does this, how exactly does this work, right? So right now you have all your knowledge, and usually you think about your job, you know, you have a job application, you put your job application on your code on GitHub, right? Or, or on a repository somewhere. But we gotta do more than that, right? We gotta put, you know, every knowledge that we have, our, our websites, our database, you know, our infrastructure management, everything has to become software in our repository. There's all kinds of tools, so Flyway allows you to uh, manage, you know, to put your database in the repository, so you can recreate the database when you need, you can migrate your database. Ansible and Chef allows you to, to tr transform your infrastructure, your infrastructure as, a co as code. So all of these becomes code. We're not talking about uh, uh, manuals anymore for operations to follow. It's our code. <coughs> and then Jenkins can get that definition that we wrote as code and, create, and use Packer to create Docker containers. Right? To create your containers. Now, your, 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 packing, your Packer allows you to build images, virtual, you know, virtual machine images or container images out of the definitions from your infrastructure, out of your software. So inside the container, you have your Java code, your Ruby code, your infrastructure code. Everything is packed here. Right? And your application can be a, a multiple containers. Right? And then, now that you have the containers, James can use tools like Vagrant, for example, right, to run the containers on your development environments. So you can have you know, in your, uh, your own machine or maybe in a development server, you can have all the environment that was created uh, for, you to, for you to run. The same containers can now be run on your test environments, right? The same definitions can be run for testing. And now you can, you can recreate your test environment as many times as you need really fast. And then the same definition of containers, right? You can use to put anywhere you want, on Amazon, or on, on Azure, on JLS, on OpenStack, or even on your own servers. Now the beauty of all of these is that your operations guys, they can have the right tools to, to manage containers. And so they don't need to understand everything that, that you're doing. They don't need to slow you down. And once you have all of these, all open source tools, everything here is open source. It doesn't matter if you're doing a very, very small project or a very, very large project. Companies of all sizes are using exactly those set of tools to create the environments. Once you do this, then shipping becomes second nature. Right? Then you focus on shipping because there is an interesting thing. We try, uh, you know, this whole discussion about development versus production, and we say, oh, we develop and we want to innovate, and production, the operations guy that lets us innovate. Operations says we want to make things stable. Those crazy developers want to just change everything all the time, and both developers and operations, we forget that our objective is not to have innovation or stability. 
Our objective is to have good software in the hands of the users. And good software in the hands of the users is innovative software with quality, with performance, with stability. Service is software running. So un until we realize that what we need to maximize is not the innovation, we, or we don't need to maximize the stability, we need to maximize the results the end user. Until you realize that, we keep fighting. But in truth, we already have the tools right now to innovate, keep stability, and focus on delivering software. Cloud computing, containers, is the way for us to stop being perfectionist. Is the way for us to stop, to, to get away from the fear of delivery. And we got really to, uh, uh, to get ourselves into the mood of focus on delivery, right? So, uh, here are my contacts. We do have these slides available on this on this wheel around here, and we you and me and Ed, so we can keep you uh, posted with all, with all the news about the fear of delivery. But right now, as an industry, if we really want to be software companies, we do have to get over the fear of delivery. To do this, containers is the best solution that we have right now uh, to do that. And as future developers, we need to be open to learn those new things to actually benefit from all of these and take our job skills to a new level. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm not sure if we have time for questions or no questions or later. Okay, maybe we have one or two questions. Is anybody? Okay, no question? No question? Oh, All right. Yeah. Oh, there's a question right here. Please. Hey. Uh, well. <laughs> um, maybe you can say uh, how can we implement, implement continuous integration with such infrastructure? Well, how uh, do we How do we make it uh, that the user can see the difference uh, between is, uh, is there a deploy process or not? How, how we uh, change the software without informing the user? Well, how do you change the software without informing the user? Well, I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's all kinds of different applications out there, of course, right? You know, if you're, if you're doing a, a web application, for example, it's very easy to change the software without informing the user. You do this route all the time. Uh, you know, you have, if you're using Facebook, for example, Facebook changes software all the time. If you're using Netflix, Netflix delivers software all the time, and the user just needs to be notified, right? So there's, a, there's all kinds of ways. If you're doing a desktop application, it's a little bit harder. But there's also ways for you to, to deliver the application. You know, that's why, uh, uh, for example, uh, we, we use the, the desktop project I, I talked to you, uh, to you about, about before. Uh, we use JNN, JNLP to deliver new, new version of application to the user. So, so many software are doing this today. So there's all kinds of ways for you to deliver software uh, to the end user. So the thing is, we need to focus on what do I need to do to get the software in the hands of the, the hands of the users faster, right? Once we focus on that, we have to find out your particular case, your particular software, what is the best way to do. So if you want to tell me later what is exactly that you're trying to do, I, I, I can answer like more specific to what you, you are asking. Okay? Okay, thank you, Bruna. It was Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you.